for your leadership, and we're really, really grateful. And I know your chairman is going to introduce you today, and it is an extreme pleasure for us to do that. So today, would you all please welcome the Lifeway Report to the platform today. Gary Richardson is going to come as the chairman of the board. Would you welcome them today? Thank you, Mr. President. I am Gary Richardson, and I'm a messenger from Mississippi, but I also have the privilege of serving on the Board of Trustees at Lifeway. Your uh, book of reports, page 60 and following, will give the full report of uh, the life of Lifeway. But I want you to know that this last year has been a good, good year for Lifeway. It's been a year of significant change. And I have had the privilege of watching this uh, executive leadership team behind me as they have led godly, competent, amazing individuals. And they are led by Dr. Tom Rayner, our CEO and president. It is my privilege to present him to you now to bring our report. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. And First of all, I need to thank you, Dr. Floyd, for the amazing leadership that you have symbolized and enacted through this entire past year. And I echo the affirmation of Barry McCarty. He is not only a parliamentarian cum laude, but he is a man of God and a man of conviction. And to know that he is here to keep us in proper parliamentary order is not only a blessing of business, it's a blessing of God. I want to thank Southern Baptists for the quality and the commitment and the expertise of the trustees you send us each year. This group of men and women are devoted to helping us be the best servants to the churches that we can possibly be. Lifeway launched the third phase of a three-year strategy to provide four complete curriculum brands, each based on a different starting point. Life text, theology, and your church. You'll hear more about that, and I want you to listen very carefully to it in the presentation by Eric Geiger and Ed Stetzer. Lifeway experienced a third consecutive year of growth in the number of ongoing Bible study curriculum materials, what has been commonly called Sunday School. This followed Southern Baptist nearly 30 years of a slow, but steady decline. This means that more Southern Baptists are in the Word, studying it with one of these starting points with faithful material. Ridgecrest Conference Center hosted more than 64,000 guests and more than 2,100 campers at Camp Ridgecrest for boys and Camp Crest Ridge for girls, resulting in many people coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ and many people giving their lives to vocational ministry and to the mission field. BNH Publishing celebrated 28 titles on the Christian Booksellers Association bestseller list and was voted the Spanish Publisher of the Year for the second year in a row. 185 Lifeway Christian stores serve almost 2.7 million customers. They partnered with thousands of customers in the International Mission Board, and they sent 200,000 Bibles to South Asia and 126,000 Bibles to Central America. All of this has happened in a season of significant change for Lifeway. Conventional wisdom says that when things are going well, you don't want to make any changes. But our leadership believes that you make strategic changes when your organization is strongest. Let me share with you three of those most significant changes that we have already begun to ensue. The first change concerns our facilities. Lifeway and its predecessor, the Baptist Sunday School Board, have been in Nashville nearly 120 years. We are the largest landowner in the booming downtown city of Nashville. But some of our current buildings were built shortly after the turn of the 20th century. They've served us well, 
But these buildings were not designed for today's technology or collaborative work environments or the culture in which we are a part. So many of you know who serve in leadership in the local church that church practices have changed. Well, the publishing industry has changed too, and LifeWay's needs have changed. For example, our printing is now done all over the country instead of downtown Nashville. Our assembly and shipping is centered in relatively new facilities in Lebanon, Tennessee. And the operation buildings, which used to be our warehouse and distribution center, sit mostly empty. In fact, about two-thirds of our facilities are not used by LifeWay. Messengers, you have allowed me to serve for 10 years as president of LifeWay. You've elected the board which elected me. And one of the things that you expect of me in my leadership and this team behind me is that we are the best stewards possible of God's money that has been entrusted to us. We cannot waste time and money and other resources on inefficient facilities. Currently, our, our employees are scattered through nine different buildings on nearly 15 acres. We have 1.2 million square feet of working space, which is five times more than the space we need. Our new building will house all of our people in corporate LifeWay downtown together in one building at almost 300,000 square feet, resulting in a great stewardship of the resources that we have been entrusted. As we plan to relocate, we will not forget those who came before us. We have formed a historical committee composed of employees and retirees who will help take our history with us. So when we sell our current facilities, where will we move? Well, we hope to have that location finalized in a few weeks, and we're hoping to remain in downtown Nashville. Groundbreaking for the new building, we anticipate will take place in late 2017. The second major change that we have had is we've brought our two publishing units together, Church Resources and BNH. BNH will continue to be the imprint for our books. But it no longer makes good stewardship to have two different publishers under one roof. The fusion of these two divisions has given us an incredible opportunity to lead with LifeWay Biblical Solutions for Life. We are one LifeWay. The third major change is to tie the new resources division and all those things that we publish more deliberately into our retail division, our stores. Too often in the past, we have focused on what we should not carry in our stores. We will be focusing more on what we should carry. We will lead with LifeWay, Biblical Solutions for Life. And the stores will become more and more an expression of LifeWay. Closer alignment between the stores and our resources means that we will be providing for you more than ever Biblical Solutions for Life. These changes I've shared with you are not changed for the sake of change. These changes are being done because we believe what is best to serve our churches. Change is not about us, the current leadership. It's about us seeking God's face, moving forward where he shows us. That is what we are doing, and we covet your prayers as we go. Thank you, Mr. President. It would be unusual for me to have any questions, but... I stand here in case there are any. Thank you, Dr. Rayner. Are there any questions concerning the report of LifeWay that has been given by Dr. Tom Rayner? We do have a question at microphone 2A. Please state your name and your church. Uh, Alan Cross, Gateway Baptist Church, Montgomery, Alabama. And kind of following up on some things we were talking about before. But uh, Dr. Rayner, one of the themes of this convention has been revival and working together across the SBC. We've seen that expressed in a multi-ethnic way that has been profound. So could you speak to, just for a moment, what LifeWay is doing in this area to serve multi-ethnic congregations and bringing in uh, authors uh, from different perspectives as well? Thank you, Alan. And I, maybe I shouldn't respond directly to a messenger like this, but I just 
I have to say, Ellen, I appreciate your heart. I appreciate the emphasis you have brought to this particular convention. And I, I, I really appreciate you being a continuous reminder to us of the kingdom of God and its great ethnic diversity. Lifeway is making strides. Please, for Alan, you can do that. Lifeway is making strides, and I would say this, we're moving forward, but at the same time, we are not where we should be. We are essentially taking three approaches to this, and these are not necessarily sequential, but they're the emphases that we're having to make certain that our organization that you have entrusted to us through your trustees is truly reflecting of the kingdom of God. The first of these emphases, emphases is to listen. We have spent this last year listening carefully to those of other ethnic groups, other racial groups, and other groups that can inform us about things that we who are Anglo will definitely need greater emphasis and in information on. It has been a joy to have different groups come over to Lifeway. It has been a joy to listen to them and to hear from them about directions that we should take. Our first emphasis has been to listen. The second emphasis has been to lead. Quite frankly, if the leadership of an organization is not leading in this endeavor to reflect the diversity that is in the kingdom of God, it won't happen. And in that sense, it begins with me and the executive team behind me. We will continue to have greater emphasis on ethnic diversity, but we have a long way to go. But we will seek to lead in that direction. Third, we will not only listen, we will not only lead, but we will learn. And the way we learn is by getting resources into the churches. And the way that we get resources into the churches of different ethnic groups is to be able to know what the greatest needs there are. I am pleased to report to you that Lifeway now has over 1,000 of our resources, 1,000 of our resources in the breadth of Lifeway that are in a non-English language. Of those 1,000 resources, they are in 35 different languages. We listen. We lead, we learn. Has Lifeway arrived in this endeavor? Absolutely not. But is it something that we are determined to do so? Absolutely so. Because the kingdom of God is bigger than any one group. Thank you, Dr. Rayner, for the Lifeway report. Would y'all please express gratitude to Dr. Rayner and the entire team? We're now ready for the LifeWay presentation. So, Dr. Rayner, we turn it over to your team for this presentation. Well, it is my joy to present two of my colleagues, Dr. Eric Geiger and Dr. Ed Stetzer. Friends, uh, during our presentation this afternoon, as we conclude what has truly been an exciting time for our convention and for our churches, I want to leave you with an encouragement, especially with our role to pastors as shepherds. You see, many pastors struggle with their role. They struggle with their responsibility to shepherd the people that come to their church. If that's you, let me encourage you by pointing out two biblical realities commonly observed in growing healthy churches. First, healthy churches are in community, meaning groups. And second, healthy Christians are in the Word. You know, that may sound simplistic, but it's a pattern that we see over and over again. Take a look at your church and see if it's true. If we will be faithful in leading our people to engage at these two points, the fruit will appear in all aspects of our church's lives. For the remainder of time, I'm inviting Dr. Geiger and Dr. Stetzer to share more about these two biblical realities, as well as some tools that can help you encourage people in your church to engage in groups and to remain in the Word. Thank you, Dr. Rayner. So what we want to do over the next couple of moments is really double-click on those two statements that Dr. Rayner closed with, which really come from the scripture, but also uh, with Dr. Stetzer's area, Lifeway Research. We've really done a lot of research on how Christians, how the people in your churches are growing spiritually, how the Lord's maturing them. And so 
we want to connect the scripture to the research that we've observed and also then just share some of the resources that we are offering to you and to your churches to help see spiritual maturity take place in the people that you pastor and that you shepherd and that you serve. And so first, healthy Christians are in groups. Um, a year and a half ago, you and I released a book called Transformational Groups. And, and if, here's, here's the research in a nutshell. We found out that those who are in a group, and when we say group, we mean Sunday school class, Bible fellowship, um, small group, whatever nomenclature you use, those who are in a group, so if you're looking at your church, those Christians who are in a small group as opposed to those who are not in a group, those who are in a group are, based on the research, they are more likely, um, they, they pray more frequently, they give more sacrificially, they serve more regularly, they share the gospel with friends and neighbors at a much higher rate, they confess their sins and repent more regularly. Basically, those who are in biblical community, who are regularly in a group of other Christians, who challenge them and encourage them and apply the gospel, the good news of Jesus to their hearts, we see attributes of discipleship in those people to a far greater degree than those people who are not in a small group. So healthy Christians are in groups. The scripture teaches us in Hebrews 3 verse 13 that as long as we encourage one another, as long as it is called today, the, script, the, the writer of Hebrews says, encourage one another as long as it is called today so that none of you will be hardened by sin's deception. According to this verse, my heart is going to get hard. It's going to be deceived by sin. Sin is going to deceive my heart. But what's going to stop my heart from being deceived is biblical community, being surrounded by people who are going to speak the truth to me in love, who are going to shepherd my heart, who are going to challenge me and for me to live in community. So we, we want to help churches get their Christians to live in biblical community because healthy Christians are in groups. But we believe these groups is really important that we don't just get people together and they stare at one another and, and have surface community. We believe that healthy community is built on the truth of God's word. And Ed's going to mention one of, of our resources here in a moment. But and, and actually when you came in, Facts and Trends magazine has what Dr. Rayner referenced a moment, the four starting points. And so we've done a lot of listening to churches. And what we've, what we've found is that some groups and maybe even some churches prefer to study the scripture in their Sunday school classes or their small groups from a different starting point than another church. Or maybe it's a different season in your church's life or your Sunday school class's life. And for a season, you want to start with life issues and go to the scripture. Or you just want to start with the biblical text and dive into that. Or perhaps you want to start from a theological vantage point. So we have different curriculum lines for these different starting points. For, for life, we have Bible studies for life. For text, we have Explore the Bible. For theology, and Ed's going to talk about this in a moment, we have the Gospel Project. And then we just launched a new resource just a couple of months ago to help those churches who want their small groups to really be in sync with their pastor's sermons, sermon-based small groups or pulpit-based small groups. And so just a couple of months ago, we launched smallgroup.com. And you can go home this afternoon or to your hotel room and sign up for a two-week trial. And here's what you'll find. You'll find over 1,500 studies on smallgroup.com where you can just put in the passage of Scripture, the topic that you're wanting to study, and then you can customize a study for your group with smallgroup.com. So healthy Christians are in groups, but we want these groups to be built on the foundation of God's Word. Ed's going to talk to us now about the reintroduction of the Gospel Project, which is really the theological starting point. Good, we're signed without that. You mentioned smallgroup.com. Let me encourage people to sign up for a two-week free, uh, two free trial. Yep. Go to smallgroup.com uh, and do that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Gospel Project. I have the privilege of serving as the, uh, the general editor uh, of that. And we mentioned, Eric mentioned it's kind of our theological starting point. But remember, these are starting points, right? So, so when we look at the different four starting points, they're all theological. But here we're starting with a theology and then building on that theology throughout a three-year cycle. And so one of the privileges that we have is, I mean, millions of people engage Lifeway Resources through the four starting points right. that we have. So again, a, a privilege to serve as a general editor. Really, the managing editor does, uh, is, is just brilliant, does most of the heavy lifting and thinking. His name's Trevin Wax, one, as you know, one of uh, Christianity Today's 33 leaders under 33. We have a great team that's working together. And so three years ago, many of you remember, three years ago, we stood on this very platform and introduced the Gospel Project 
project as a brand new curriculum, really for kids and for students and for adults. Uh, three years later, we are just amazed at what God has done. We've just been humbled at how God has used this uh, all around the world. They just returned from Australia. Everywhere I go, people are talking about the gospel project. And, and every year, the number of people who use the gospel project has continued to grow. Right now, as you know, more than 750,000 people yeah. every week are using this uh, Christ-centered, theologically driven, mission-shaped curriculum. And we're actually asking the Lord, you challenge us in this, we're asking the Lord to give us a million people this, this fall to use the gospel project. It says one of four lines, you can, you can uh, four starting points, you can find out more uh, in Facts and Trends. You are, this was handed to you, it's our flagship magazine at Lifeway. Uh, this was handed to you when you came in, or you can get it as you go out, or at the Lifeway booth and, and follow along, or at factsandtrends.net. So one of, one of the starting points is this theological uh, resource, theological starting point of research of the Gospel Project. But what we're particularly excited about is this fall, it's a great time to begin if you haven't already jumped in, this fall we're starting a new three-year cycle, but we're going Gospel Project chronological. Uh, and what that means is we're going to go through chronologically the, the, throughout the scriptures with all new studies, but now in the new study plan, every age from babies to adults will be studying the same Bible passage each week in and out. In other words, you can align your entire church in a three-year chronological sequence that it goes from Genesis to Revelation from a Christ-centered, theologically driven, mission-shaped perspective. This is important because here's why, right? It's, it's possible for people to know lots of Bible stories, but yet miss the Bible story. So take a moment and watch this video that explains more about that very issue. The Bible is an amazing book. It's not just a collection of stories. It's one big story where everything points to Jesus. It begins with God creating a perfect world and placing a perfect couple in the middle of it. But Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sin and death entered the world. God decided to judge the earth by sending a great flood, but he told Noah to build an ark so the animals and Noah's family could be saved. One of Noah's descendants was a man named Abraham. God promised Abraham that his family would be used to bless the whole world. The Israelites would have a special land to live in and would be as countless as the stars in the sky. When a famine spread through the land, God used Joseph to bring the Israelites to Egypt. But after a time, the Egyptians made them their slaves. So God raised up another leader, Moses, to rescue his people and lead them to the promised land. God performed amazing miracles along the way. He taught the Israelites how to live. He showed them how to build a tent called the tabernacle where sacrifices could be offered for their sins. But even after they arrived in the promised land, the Israelites continued to rebel. They worshiped idols and demanded a human king instead of God. God was patient and allowed them to have a king. One of those kings was David, who defeated Goliath. David's son Solomon built a beautiful temple for God that replaced the tabernacle. But Solomon's sin caused the kingdom to be split in two. During this difficult time, prophets like Isaiah told the people about the Messiah. The Messiah would make things right with God again. Even when the Israelites were conquered by other kingdoms, they held on to the promise that one day the Messiah would come and rescue them. In time, God led the Israelites back to the land. The temple was rebuilt. Jerusalem's walls were repaired. The prophet Malachi foretold that the Messiah was on the way. Then, silence. For 400 years, God remained quiet. The silence was broken by the cry of a tiny baby born in a manger. His name was Jesus. Jesus was the Messiah. 
He lived a sinless life, performed miracles, and showed the people how to return to God again. Some believed Jesus. Most did not. He was arrested and crucified on a cross. And then something amazing happened. Three days after his death, Jesus came to life again, conquering death and defeating sin once and for all. At the beginning, we said that all of the Bible points to Jesus. So you might think it's strange that he appears so late in the story. Or does he? Look closely, and you'll find signs that point to Jesus right from the very beginning. God used the ark to save Noah, pointing to the day when we would find salvation in Jesus. God promised to bless the world through Abraham's family, which he did through Jesus. The sacrifices pointed to Jesus, who became the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. The pages of the Bible are filled with stories that point us to Jesus. But the story doesn't end there. Jesus' friends carried his message to the ends of the earth. Faithful followers like Peter, Paul, and others shared the good news wherever they went. And you and I have the same calling. We are to share Jesus wherever we go until one day, he returns to make everything right again. Yes, the Bible is full of amazing stories, but really, it's all about Jesus. That's the story. That's his story. If that didn't move your heart, your heart cannot be moved. I mean, that's an amazing picture. That's specifically for our kids. Yeah, sure, go ahead. It's, it's, it, that story is worth celebrating together. And, and that's specifically for the kids. And you can download that video at gospelproject.com. Use it in your own church if you'd like. But that theme is also what we kind of replay throughout and now chronologically align with children, students, and adults, which is one of the reasons I think it's that passion for this full story that has really encouraged people. You know, our original projections for the Gospel Project were 30,000 users, and now we're looking at a million people each and every week. So that's, we believe Jesus isn't part of the Bible story. He's the point of of the Bible story. That's why the Gospel Center, uh, the Gospel Project is Christ-centered. That's why it's, it's doctrinally sound. We have, for students and adults, we have 99 essential doctrines that people will go through and learn over the, over the three-year cycle. That's why it's missional in its application. That's been our, been, our, been, our, been our agenda all along, is to move people to mission. So, so I want to encourage you to, to go to thegospelproject.com and preview four sessions for free. You can find it there on your screen, and you can find it, of course, online. But I encourage your groups to join with, with many others, I mean, perhaps hopefully a million others, to join with a million others, including my church and the small group I lead every Sunday night at my home. And, and go to gospelproject.com and join with us uh, this fall. Eric, would you continue to share with us? So number one, healthy Christians are in groups. And then the second learning, this isn't new, this is in the text, but also we can continually see it in all of our research projects, is healthy Christians are in the Word. In fact, the spiritual discipline of dwelling in Scripture, of letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, is the spiritual discipline that impacts every sure. other spiritual discipline. So if somebody in your church is in the Scripture, that impacts all of the other spiritual disciplines. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not scarcely, not a little bit, but let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so to close, I want to share a new resource with you we have to help you allow the Word of Christ to dwell in your people richly. It's called Devo Hub. And so Devo Hub is basically, a, it's, a, it's a way your people, they'll, on their phone, they'll download the Devo Hub app and they'll show up at your church and you'll make your church a connection zone and then different devotionals will be sent to their phone from your church. It's a real simple way for every day, a tool for them to have to allow them to study the scripture every single day in their personal devotion. So devohub.com is where you'll get more information on that. Dr. Rainer, thank you so much.
Thank you so much.